This morning, we are continuing our study in the book of Esther. So if you would, please open your Bibles to Esther chapter 7. And as you are doing that, as you are looking up Esther chapter 7, let me just remind you of what we talked about last week. We talked about an unexpected twist. If this was your first time going through the book of Esther, you're, you're going through it and you're seeing that Mordecai and the Jews don't stand a chance because Haman is out to get them. Haman is King Xerxes in the Bible. He's known as King Ahasuerus. Haman is his right-hand man. And the king had made an order that everybody should bow down to Haman because Haman thought he was some pretty good stuff, important stuff. And everybody did except for Mordecai. And did that make Haman happy or sad? It wasn't happy, right? And it wasn't even sad. It was angry. He was upset where he wanted to not just punish Mordecai, but he wanted to annihilate all of the Jews within the Persian Empire. And Haman went to King Xerxes and said, Hey, there's this group of people. They are bad. They are no good. We need to get rid of them. And Xerxes gives him his his signet ring and says, Sure, go ahead. Do whatever makes you happy. Whatever needs to be done, go ahead and do it. And throughout this, the Jews obviously were not happy. They were saddened. Mordecai mourns, and he converses with Esther through a, through a third party. And really, he, he convinces, challenges Esther to talk to the king on their behalf. And at first, she's timid, but she goes ahead and does it. And she does, she has a, she approaches him, and King says, what do you want? He, she's like, I would like a feast for you and Haman to come, just the two of you, and feast. And Xerxes says, yeah, sounds good. Haman says, man, that is awesome. That is awesome. Only me and the king. Can you imagine being invited to, to uh, a dinner party where only you and the most important person in the world we're invited to? Would you think that that's pretty important, pretty special? Yeah, and Haman, and Haman did. And so we, he goes through, and we see in, um, in chapter 6, uh, or at the end of chapter 5, per se, you know, he, Haman comes home, and he's on cloud 9. He's just so happy. However, on the way home, he passes by Mordecai, and Mordecai doesn't bow down to him, and all of a sudden, his happy day turned into an angry day. He goes home, tells his wife and friends about what happened, and they say, you know what? Mordecai is no good. Build a gallows 75 feet high, hang him on it. That'll show him, not only him, but everybody else who sees him will know, don't mess with Haman. So that night, that very night, Xerxes, and this is what we talked about last week, Xerxes couldn't sleep. He had the chronicles read to him, the history of his empire, of of what has happened under the Persian rule when he was king. And throughout that was mentioned about Mordecai and how Mordecai saved the king's life. Two eunuchs had conspired together to assassinate Xerxes. Uh, Mordecai found out about it, told Esther about it, and Esther told Xerxes, and they discovered that Mordecai was right. And as this was read, Xerxes asked, what was done to him? How was he rewarded? The answer, he wasn't. So the king now is like, he really wants to to honor this guy because Persian kings, if somebody stopped an assassination, were you typically grateful and would you typically award them? Yeah, they would. They didn't, so he's got to fix this. Wouldn't you know who comes walking into the king's court at just the right time? Haman. And Haman's coming to ask uh, Xerxes if he can kill Mordecai. That's kind of an awkward situation. Hey, can I kill the guy who saved your life? But the king spoke first. And that day ended up very terrible for Haman because instead of killing his nemesis, he had to parade him around town on the king's horse in the king's clothes. And Haman, we, we left Haman last week, went home with his head covered in shame. He gets home, he tells his wife and friends what had happened, 
And what does his wife say? She says, oh, you're doomed. (laughs) But you're the one who gave me this advice. Yeah, you're doomed because he's a Jew. And if you know anything about history, the Jews, they just keep getting back up. They keep getting attacked. Uh, Bad things happen to them, but they keep going. And at the end of the chapter, Esther's eunuchs, or not Esther's eunuchs, but the king's eunuchs come in. They grab Haman and say, hurry up. We got to go to the feast. And that's what we're talking about today. What we're talking about today is that sin destroys. And we're going to see in in Haman's life really how much sin destroys. Now, we're taught, right, anywhere you look in media today, and if we listen to sin, what does sin promise you? Sin promises happiness. You sin, you're going to feel great, live life to its fullest, because you only, it, this is all you get. So do what pleases you. Nothing else matters. And sin, it's tempting. Right? And have you ever listened to sin when sin, it, it, you get that temptation, it says, oh, you do this and you will feel good. You do this, all of your problems will be solved. You ever heard? Has sin ever said that to you? And then have you followed through? Has sin delivered on its promises? No. No, it doesn't. And so that's what we're talking about today, is we're talking about sin and how it destroys. But before we get into chapter 7, let's just bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, we just uh, come before you this morning. Lord, as as we work our way through this chapter, Lord, we just see what sin does. We see the end of the road. Lord, just where sin leads us. Lord, I just pray that this morning as we work through this chapter, again, Lord, that you would just open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears. Lord, that not only would we learn from your word this morning, but that we would apply it to our lives. Lord, I just pray that you would work in our lives today, that our lives would be changed, that at the end we would be just a little bit more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. So this chapter begins with Esther, and she reveals the sin. We all have sin, and maybe we have sin that's hidden. Do you have sin that's hidden that nobody else knows about? What's it like when that sin is revealed? It's scary. It's, in, it, it's intimidating. It's what we don't want to happen. But that's how Esther starts off in this chapter. Let's read verses 1 and 2 because it talks about a successful feast because that's, that's how it starts. So let's read. Follow with me, if you would, the first two verses of Esther chapter 7. So the king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, The king again said to Esther, What is your wish, queen? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Now, how many times at this point has the king asked the queen, What do you want? This is the third time, because the first time she was in the outer, uh, in the courts, and she was risking her life, because did you dare approach the king without his requesting you? No. Because if he didn't hold out his scepter to you, you would die. So she did that, and he asked, hey, what do you want? She's like, oh, I want to have a feast for you. And Haman, so they do that. They have the feast. After dinner, he says, hey, what do you want? The same thing. Hey, I want you to come back again tomorrow night for a feast. And so here he's asking the third, the third, uh, well, the second night, but really the third time he's like, okay, what do you want? And we talked about when he says up to half my kingdom, that was used by kings as a figure of speech. And what that meant was, as long as I'm legally able to do it, because the king, was he above Persian law? No, he wasn't. So he basically saying, whatever you want, I'll give to you. What is your wish and what is your request? And we know that it was a successful feast because after the feast, they 
they had uh, wine, which was customary, as a time of relaxing, a time of just socializing. And obviously it was good, otherwise he wouldn't say, <laughs> what do you want? Esther pleased the king, what do you want? So then Esther makes a humble request. A humble request. Verses 3 and 4 says this. Um, just lost my place. There it is. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent. For our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. So what's her request? She says, my wish is for my life. That's a good thing to ask for, right? She doesn't want to die. But not only that, but it's for her people as well. My request is for my people. Now it's interesting because she says here, what, what does she say here? She says, for my people, right? They're signed up to be destroyed and to be annihilated. Now what's interesting here is, is what she says after that. She says, if my people had just been sold as slaves, that's fine. I would have been content with that. I wouldn't have bothered you with this request if just my people were put in slavery. Now put yourself in that position. Would you cry out if, if you were to be sold as a, as a slave? Would you cry out, say, hey, this is unfair? Get me out of here? Probably. But for the Jews, had they ever been sold into slavery? Yeah, they have, time and time again. And so we talked about this last week. As, as Jews, were, should they, if they're following God, really, should they be ex expected to suffer sometimes? Yeah. For us as Christians, if we're honoring God, should we come across conflict? Should we expect it? Doesn't the scripture say, don't be surprised that the world hates you? Why? Because it hated Jesus first. It, it hated me first, right? It hated Jesus first. So when we're afflicted, it should come as no surprise to us. But here she says, she uses these words, and these words are interesting because she uses the same language as the decree. That Xerxes okayed. Now, did Xerxes actually read this decree? Probably not, because he gave the signet ring to who? To Haman. So Haman did this decree just a few days prior. And you can just imagine what is going through Haman's mind right now. Oh, her people are being, oh, oh, uh-oh. I just signed a decree with the king's name on it to do that. So we don't know how quick Haman was, but you know Haman's having a bad day. Yeah, he has a feast again. Okay, that's good. But now maybe his wife's words are, are in the back of his mind. You're doomed. And he hears this, and he's like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. And then Esther, she's revealing this, and she makes a specific accusation. Verses 5 and the first part the first part of six. It says, then, then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, who is he and where is he who has dared to do this? Is he happy? No, somebody's threatened his wife, his queen. Man, would you be excited if somebody threatened the life of your spouse and, and their family? Unless you really don't like the in-laws. And Esther said to him, a foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. There it is. Now, I had to look that up because in my mind, foe and enemy mean the same thing. Do you know the difference between foe and enemy? Everybody knows what an enemy is, somebody you go against. A foe is an enemy who used to be, or at least portrays to be, a friend. That's what a foe is. And when we look at that, is Haman a foe. 
Yes, because he's pretending to be uh, the king's friend. When he makes this, this edict to annihilate the Jews, does he have Xerxes' best interest in mind? No, he doesn't. Whose best interest does he have in mind? Himself. Himself. And so you can just picture there's this scene, and all of a sudden Esther mentions about this decree, and then she points the finger and says, this wicked man, this evil man, Haman. Put yourself in Haman's shoes right now. What is going through your mind? Yeah, exactly. How fast can I get out of that? What can I do? Like, oh, man. Not how the day prior started out or, or ended up being right. It was such, such a good day. And within, what, 24 hours, his whole world has come it, it, crashing down. So Esther reveals the sin. Now we see how Xerxes realizes the sin. Because Xerxes is really oblivious to all this. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know the nationality of the people that Haman wants to get rid of. We're not even aware that he's, uh, he's not even aware of, of Esther's nationality up until this point. But let's read 6b to 8. It says, Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. He was terrified. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden but Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden to the, um, to the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling um, on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, Will you even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? Wow. Wow. As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. So what does Xerxes do? He takes a walk. He's in a conflicting environment right now. He loves his queen. He thought he could trust Haman. And now his queen is accusing Haman of something. And he must know there's something to it because Haman is terrified. And Xerxes can tell that there's truth in what Esther is saying. So he takes a walk by himself. We don't know exactly what's going on. But I think Xerxes realized too, Haman made this decree. And whose signature is on this decree? His own. So in essence, the king gave permission to have his wife, and everybody related to her, right? All the Jews to be annihilated. Does that look good for the king? No. So here he is trying to, maybe, maybe trying to figure out what's going on. You ever been in a place like that? The truth comes out and what you thought you knew was true isn't true. And you're just in a place where you're just trying to figure out, okay, what should I do? What should I do? And typically, we've seen Xerxes, when he needs to make a decision, what does he do? He asks people. Just yesterday, or no, even just that morning, he asked Haman, hey, what should I do to the guy who, who I wish to honor? Now is the king going to say, hey, so Haman, what should I do to the guy I wish to uh, be angry with? Would he ask Haman that? Oh, you know what? Haman would say, you know, just... Give him a pass. You know, everybody makes mistakes. No, but Xerxes, he takes walks, and, and then he comes back, and he sees the truth, doesn't he? He sees the truth. Let's read, let's read um, that again. Let's read that again. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. What did it look like from the king's perspective? From his perspective, it looked like he was trying to molest the queen in his own house. 
All right. Again, guys, you walk in on a situation like that, are you going to be like, oh, yeah, that's cool, whatever? Or are you going to flip your lid? Now, what's interesting, too, is because we learn here that, that Haman is actually convicted not of tricking the king, but actually, was that Haman's intention? Was his intention to assault the queen? No. What was he doing? He was begging for his life. So really, he was falsely a- accused. So what truth did, did Xerxes see in all this? The truth is that Haman served Haman. Did it bother Haman that Mordecai was going to die? Or that all these other Jews that he never met were going to die? Did Haman lose any sleep over that? No. But when it came to his life, oh man, that changes everything for Haman, doesn't it? And Xerxes sees here that Haman only cares about himself. It's also good now because Xerxes now has an excuse to get rid of Haman. Because not only was it wrong to to assault the queen, but in fact Haman wasn't even going to supposed to be within seven steps of the queen. Specifically when the king wasn't around. You were supposed to keep your distance. He didn't. He didn't. He's there begging. Begging for his life. It's also interesting, who did he want to bow down to him? Mordecai, a Jew. Now, who is he bowing down to to ask for his life? Esther, a Jew. It's amazing how circumstances can change the way we feel about people, isn't it? And here we see Haman doing just that and we see here that Haman is ruined by the sin let's read 9a then Harbona one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king said moreover the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai whose word saved the king is standing at Haman's house 50 cubits high I'm sorry that's all of verse 9 isn't that his, Harbona? Do you remember Harbona? We read about him in the first chapter. He was one of the eunuchs that was sent to get Queen Vashti. So it's plausible that he was also sent to get Haman for the feast. And maybe while he was there, he saw this gallows. And he was, hey, what's this for? But what's interesting is I don't think people liked Haman. I think Haman manipulated his way into power. We see here that he was very self-centered, self-focused, only cared about himself. And if you know anybody who cares about themselves, and you see that they only care about themselves, are they people that you just enjoy to be with? No, not typically. So here's Harbona, right? He's, He's standing around. He's watching this. He knows that that um, Haman is, is going to get killed and then he pipes up and says oh hey king by the way can I, can I speak up just so you know this guy Haman built a gallows for Mordecai yeah remember the guy who saved your life and you paraded him around today you honored him yeah he built these gallows for him I, I can just picture Harbonus like I hate this guy this guy's annoying oh he's going to get it let me offer a bit of advice Right? It's, almost, it's almost like a sibling right there. Oh, they're going to get in trouble? Let me speak up. And I know the perfect thing for him to do. And I can just picture Haman's fa- face, which you couldn't see because it was covered at this point. Man, wouldn't that be scary? You know you're going to face judgment, but you can see. That's one thing. But can you imagine being whisked away and facing judgment with your head covered where you couldn't see? Oh, man. What's worse, typically, um, the punishment or waiting for the punishment to happen? Sometimes the, the, the waiting for it, the anticipation of it is horrible. And so here he's covered, and he's here, and, and he's like, oh, Harbona. <laughs> Maybe I should have been nicer to you, too. 
But here he speaks up and says, hey, king, I have an idea. I have an idea. And Haman gets hanged. And the king said, hang him on that. The king thought it was a great idea. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. We see here that sin always destroys. This sin always destroys. Something I was thinking about, and so somebody used this as an illustration, as, as just going through Esther. Are you familiar with Looney Tunes? With Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner? You're familiar with that, right? Yeah, it's hilarious. Because Wile E. Coyote, who does he hate more than any, anything else? The Roadrunner. Now, what did the roadrunner do to him, to Wile E. Coyote? Nothing. Just goes beep, beep. Right? Beep, beep. That's all he does. But Wile E. Coyote can't get him out of his mind. And so what does he do? He spends all this. He orders everything from Acme, right? Acme Industries or Incorporated or whatever. And what ends up happening every single time is the trap that was laid out for the roadrunner Gets, gets the coyote every single time. It's interesting because if the coyote stopped chasing the roadrunner, he'd be fine. If Haman didn't have that hatred for Mordecai, he would have been fine. But it's that hatred that killed him. And Haman is a good example of what happens when we let sin control our lives. His sin, it, it promised happiness. It promised a life serving the king in the palace, being number two in the biggest nation at that time. It offered so much. But yet, in the end, where did it lead Haman to death. And the gallows on his property 75 feet high to show everybody what happens <laughs> when you disobey when you disobey the king. What a powerful testimony and reminder that is. Haman also teaches us the difference between regret and repentance. We all sin. When we realize that we sin and we want to stop, we repent. We tell God, hey God, I am sorry for doing this. I know it's wrong. Please help me to not do it again. What is regret? It's feeling bad too, but it's feeling bad because you got caught. And you want to try to do it and, and not get caught again. You see, earlier that day when Haman realized that this edict went out against Mordecai and, and all the Jews, the guy who saved the king, he was in a position now. Oh, man, I, I, this is going to happen. It's an edict. Mordecai is going to get cut down. He could have gone to the king and said, hey, king, I messed up. I goofed. Here I went to, uh, to get Mordecai, and, and I was so angry with him that I just, getting him wasn't enough. I had to get his entire people. But he didn't do that. He was trying to figure out, okay, what can I do? How, how can I get out of this? And again, just the final blow was he fell before the Jews. It was supposed to be the other way around. But that's how sin is. And it's frustrating, and it's difficult, and it's hard, because so many times we feel like the Jews. We feel like there are people out to get us, and the people who are sinners, the people who don't fear God, they're living the high life. They're second in command. They do what they want, when they want, how they want. 
And sometimes we can think, man, if only I sinned, if only I lived like them, then I could enjoy the good life. But in the end, where does it lead? It leads to death, to destruction. Everybody here is tempted to sin. Everybody here has sinned. And hopefully everybody here has fought with sin and not just given in and not just, hey, this is fun, I'm going to do this. If you're anything like me, you know that sin leads to destruction. And the longer you wait to take care of it, the longer you wait to repent, the more disastrous it is. So let Haman be, be a reminder that if you are living in sin, that you repent before it's too late. One other thing as we close to remember is that God will ultimately defeat all of his enemies. Today, it may look like they're in charge. It may, it may look like that their reign, their power is never going to end. But guess what? It will. It will. God will defeat his enemies. Sin destroys. Sin always destroys. Let's pray.